Well, welcome to Merch Church. Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? It's good to be in this house. Come on, let me see a hint. Yeah, come on, we sing it. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Come on, we say, I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Yeah. So the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Come on, you say, my belongs to you forever come on every voice this is my testimony from dead to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by jesus christ the righteous i'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony Together, sons and daughters, but with blood and washed in water, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started in you. Yeah, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony. here today. Thank you for joining us for a service. Thank you for being here in person with us. Guys, thank you for being here. Thank you for those of you that are watching online, whether it's going to be today or maybe sometime in the future. We thank you for joining us today. And hey, we want to encourage you to do something with us real quick. I want you to pull out your phone, go to our Facebook page, and I want you to share this live feed. Literally, when we do this, there are many, many others that
that will be able to watch this service. I want to enjoy and encourage you to do that today. If you've got, if you don't have Facebook, you can actually go to our YouTube channel. You can text this link to somebody and you can encourage them through that today. So we want to encourage you to do that. Hey, I want to welcome all of our first time guests with us this morning. Come on, help me do that today. Listen, if you are new to Merge this morning, we welcome you. We thank you for joining us. Hey, we would love to connect with you. And so one of the ways that you can do that is you can go to our to our website at merge.church. You'll see a connection uh, card there, and you can go there and you can fill that out. We'd just love to connect with you this morning, so please take some time to do that. A couple quick announcements that we've got this morning. We've got youth this evening. If you are in 6th grade through 12th grade, make plans to join us for Merge Youth here at the church this evening from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. We have a great time. We eat. We love eating. We enjoy games together. Man, we have fun. We, we share a Bible study, so make plans to join us for that. Also, don't forget this Wednesday, we encourage every one of the guys in the house to be here for Merge Men. It's going to be happening this Wednesday starting at 6.30. We do this once a month. It's usually the third Wednesday of every month. So, guys, we encourage you to, to, to join us for that this Wednesday starting at 6.30. Hey, guys, you go ahead and stand with us this morning. Now, these guys, these guys are going to go ahead and lead us in worship here in just a moment. But before they do, we're going to, we're going to take some time to worship through our giving. And so a few different ways that you can do that. On the, your way out, you'll see some generosity boxes. You can drop your gift there. You can also go to merge.church. There's a giving tab there. You can also text to give. Just text the dollar amounts, the number 84321, or you can mail your gift in. But here's the thing, guys. Everything that we do here at Merge Church, you are a part of that through your giving. And so we thank you for partnering with us. We thank you for everything that you give. And we know this, and this is something that we found out in our own lives, that when we give, the Bible teaches us that he will bless us for that giving. When we sow into God's kingdom, God will bless you for that. And so we want to thank you for partnering with us to allow us to do all the things that God has called us as a church to do. Guys, go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes. We're going to get right back into worship this morning. Guys, I shared with our team this morning some of the greatest news that anyone could possibly share. God loves you. Come on, I said God loves you. And no matter what you're going through today, no matter what you faced throughout this week, no matter the fears or the concerns or anything that you've got going on, please know God loves you and He's there for you. And no matter what you're facing in your life, He can bring you through today. This next song talks about fear this morning, that we don't have to allow fear to control us, that we don't have to be afraid of the things that come at us in life because we have a God that fights for us, that's there for us. And so over these next few minutes, we want to just put our faith in Him and and believe in Him to do all the things that He wants to do in our lives. God, we love you today. God, we give you our praise. We give you our focus this morning. I pray that you would have your way in this place, God. I thank you, Lord, for the one fact, Lord, that we can always depend on, that we can always rely on, God, that you love us. And I pray that we would just sense and feel that love in everything that we do this morning. God, we worship you. We give you our all today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've seen the faithfulness of God. 
know that you go before us and that you stand behind us and that you're beside us, that you are all around us. And so as we look at the world and we see things that may be scary, we don't have to be afraid because you are here. And so God, we just take this time to thank you and we place our confidence in who you are, not in what we see. We love you this morning. Church, just praise him today. God's goodness and mercy all around us. And this morning, I pray that you can lift up your voice. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Of the goodness of God. 
that we have and we begin to number them and acknowledge them it can't help but change the heart that we have and it turns us towards a heart of gratitude for all that we have and all that you are God we give you praise and honor and glory because you're worthy of everything that we have and everybody in the house said a great big amen come on give this team some praise give Jesus some praise Man, give somebody some knucks before you sit down. I'm not going to have you hug anybody yet, but we need some knucks. We need some love in this place. Man, I'm excited about today, excited to have you here. If you're joining us online, we say thank you for being with us and tuning in. We're in this series called True North, and we took a, a week off last week for Mother's Day to honor the moms, but... True North, the premise is essentially this, that True North is a place on a map that is a preset destination that is unchanging, but Magnetic North, if you pull your compass out and you attempt to go north, then what you'll actually find is that it deviates just a little bit from what True North is. And for many of us, we're in pursuit of a more meaningful spiritual life, but our challenge is we're, we're just a degree off. Maybe two degrees off. We're just a smidge off from where we're supposed to be. And that doesn't seem like a big deal in the short run, but over a long period of time, it becomes a really big deal to just be a little bit off. So what is true north? Well, Jesus is the only way to find true north. So who is Jesus? Well, we've been breaking down the seven I am statements from the book of John where Jesus tells us exactly who he is. What better place to look if we want to know who Jesus genuinely is in our lives and to us than to look at the words of Jesus himself. And today we're going to look at John 14 and 6. Jesus answered. What's Jesus answering? He's answering Thomas. Jesus has his disciples gathered around. It's toward the end of his earthly life. And he's explaining to them that, hey, in my father's house there are many rooms. And I'm going to go away from you to make a place for you in my father's house. And Thomas is like, but we don't know where you're going. Like, this doesn't make a lot of sense, Jesus. We don't know what you're talking about, bro. So Jesus answers Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is like, Thomas, listen, bro, like, you're complicating this. You see, you, like, you want a garment to set on your dash to tell you what direction it is that you need to go. But here's the truth. All you need to know is me. And if you know me, you know the way, you know the truth, you know the life. What Jesus is saying is, I am it. You ready to go home? Right? It's the message. That's, that's the good news. But do you ever go to a place or get around someone that just kind of has it? Like that it factor? You know, like you walk in some places and you can't even define what it is. You just know that it's right. Like it just, it's just like, oh, man, like that's it, right? Like, for some of you, you don't know how to decorate. I know that's offensive, but it's just the truth, okay? Some of you don't know how to decorate, but you walk into someone's home that is beautifully decorated, and it has this it factor, right? You walk in, it just feels good. It just feels like home. You cannot tell me why, 
You can't explain that the pictures and the mirrors are hung at eye level instead of 17 feet up. That's not where they belong. You can't explain to me that the proportions are correct and that the, 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 the sitting area is where people actually face one another to have an actual conversation. You can't explain to me that, that it's not cluttered, that there's clear walkways and the coffee table isn't too close. It's not an ottoman. I get worked up about these things in my life. It just has it. Don't we all want it? Like, just, like I just want it. So what is it? I don't know. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. He says, I'm it. How do I have it? I wish I could give you some magical recipe in your life, right? That it's like you can take it to your business, to your marriage, to your parenting, to your workplace, to your school, to the hallways. And like you would just all of a sudden like you're it. Like you got it. You, you got the it factor in your life. Like we pursue the it factor as a church constantly, right? Like you want it. Whatever it is, right? It's just Jesus. Jesus is like don't complicate it. You don't need a garment. You, you, you don't need all this extra stuff. What you need is it. Like, we know that it has a lot to do with the Holy Spirit. We know that it has a lot to do with the culture that you create around you. Like, what do you mean by culture? Culture is just the things that you actually do, not the things you say you do. The things you actually value through your actions. We know that God makes it happen, that it's for God's glory that it's for God's recognition, that it's for God to become made known to those that don't know him. We know that it's from God and by God. We know that we cannot create it. We cannot reproduce it. We cannot manufacture it. I know this. It's rare that one person will bring it, but it's common for the wrong person to kill it. We know this, and we're going to break this down because we're going to see Jesus tell his disciples what he's already told them i'm the way the truth the life and then we're going to see the early church and how they had it like i want you to understand how much it the early church had the early church had so much it that there was a dude that got bored from all of the preaching and the droning on he got so bored he fell asleep and he fell out a window i'm dead serious this is in the bible like it really is he got so bored from all the preaching he fell asleep and fell out a window but they had so much it you know what those cats did they went over and resurrected the dude, raised him back to life and said, put your ears back on, boy. You're not done listening yet. That's some it, right? But you fell asleep. Don't worry. Whoop, you're back. They had it. Why? Because they sat around the table and they heard these words. I'm the way, the truth, the life. And they believed it. And they understood that Jesus was it. Jesus was it. Everything that they needed in Acts 2, 42 through 47. We're just going to take a small look at all the it that the early church had. It says they devoted. Everyone say devoted. Mm. That's a good word, right? Devoted. Not casual. Not menial. Not marginal. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone, everyone, everyone was filled with. With awe at the many, everyone say many, many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All, everyone say all, all the believers were together, everyone say together, and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give, everyone say give, notice to who, to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Everybody help me here. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And check out this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Daily. That's it, right? Like they had it. 
They're, they're in unison and together and fellowshipping and breaking bread and learning and growing. And they have it so much so that every single day, everything comes together. I, I, heard, I heard a pastor tell a story about when he was launching his church. And, and he's like, I'm praying with my, with my launch team. And I tell him, like, imagine if, like, one person accepted Jesus every single Sunday at our church. Imagine if that happened. Like, how many people would be saved in a year if that happened? It'd be incredible. And someone says 52. <laughs> 52 of those. One a Sunday. He's like, man, I just, I want to see the numbers added to, right? I, I, want, I want to see lost people come to know Jesus. I, like, I want it. I want Jesus overflowing in my life to the point that all of those around me become infected with who he is and what he is. That they, too, wake up and say, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. No one can come to the Father except through Jesus. That's what I want my life to represent. How do I do it? I have to be devoted. And then many wonders and signs will follow, and then everyone comes together in unity. And we have to be givers to everyone that has need, and we have to praise God. And when we do, we will see the numbers added to daily. I want it. I want it. It's like, how do I get it? I just want to give you a few things that I hope we can take away that will be beneficial to all of us. I think the first thing that we got to do is we have to be laser focused. You see, more doesn't equal better. Better equals better. More is not better. Better is better. And if you genuinely believe, like I do, that the mission that you have, and you all have the same mission that I have, is the greatest, then you ought to give everything that you have to it. But one of the great challenges that, that we face in that, right, is, is, is at some point in our lives, we just like more becomes the answer. And, and what I'm finding in my life is that often less is the answer, not more. I, I need fewer things and fewer distractions. Why? Because there's a rhythm to grace. Th there's a rhythm. Like th think about all of the order and structure of God, right? Like he creates the heaven and the earth takes six days then he takes a day of rest rhythm order structure right all of the old testament feasts rhythm order structure all throughout scripture we see jesus following rhythm order structure he would go away to pray to get ready to speak to the masses he had a rhythm an order a structure to his life yet we get in this place where it's like more becomes better y'all know what a metronome is a metronome I don't have a real one. I couldn't find anybody that had a real one. I know a human metronome, and I thought the human metronome would have a metronome, but the human metronome tells me there's apps for these things now and all of this tomfoolery of the world. But you see, what a metronome is, is it, 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 it sets a rhythm. Some of y'all need to get one of these for your clapping during service. <laughs> See, and grace has a pace. I want it, right? I, 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 want, I want Jesus. I want all that Jesus has. I, I, he's the way, the truth, the life. If I'm going to follow and I have to be laser focused on the pace that Jesus has given me rather than believing that more is better. No, no, no. Better is better. And for many of you, Jesus has set this pace in your life, right? He's just, he's just clicking along. Nice and smooth, baby, right? And then, you know, kids show up, right? And then we get that promotion at work, and the kids are there. Now we're like, oh, but I got this, right? I got this, right? <laughs> 80s aerobics, baby. And then all of a sudden what happens is we let the influencers influence what we should be doing and how we should be living. And we let the bad relationships in and we let the chaos in and the fear and the anxiety. And all of a sudden 
we're at an unattainable pace in our lives. And when you're moving at this speed, what happens is you lose your focus on what really matters. You're no longer laser focused on the things that are genuine and true and meaningful. Let me, let me just give you like one example of what I mean by laser focus. And we'll use this church as the example since we're all here and a part of it, right? Like in church, often it's, it's like more is better, right? Like, well, we need this and 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 we need this. And now all of a sudden I'm at 18 ministries, 18 days a week. There's only seven, I'm aware, but it feels like 18 days a week. And we're doing all of them really poorly. That's why we do this. Sundays. Kids. Why do we do kids? Most fertile ground the world will ever know. Students. Why do we do students? Because we want to raise up a generation that propels this place forward. And what we call students today are going to be leaders a lot sooner than many of you realize in this place. They're going to have a voice and it's going to be listened to and it's going to be honored because we're not going to miss a generation. We do small groups. Why? Because we believe in fellowship and the breaking of bread and having people that you do life with every single day as you move forward. And we do missions. Why? Because we believe that God is bigger than us and bigger than this place. So we want to reach out. We want to do all of that absolutely as well as we can so we don't add to it why because more isn't better better is better and when we lose the pace of grace in our life and we begin to just be everywhere all the time everyone to everything and we we get so distracted that we no longer have the god-given intended rhythm when you read about these apostles and the early church, what you realize is that they left behind all of the things that they previously knew and created a new rhythm in their life. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He is it. They wanted it. And as a result of it, everything began to change. When you're laser focused, here's what you begin to realize, that in order to reach things no one else is reaching, you're going to have to do things that no one else is doing. To reach things that no one else is reaching, you're going to have to do things no one else is doing. You see, this, this is my wife. It was. She gone. I hope not literally. We're triple wide. What we've got here is one day my wife says, Jacob, I need you to go get a ladder. And I'm, oh, yes, ma'am, right? So I go get a ladder, and I drop it off at home, and then that night, I, I come out of the bedroom, and, and what I see is that my wife needed a ladder because she wanted to reach something that no one else had reached. See, we had light fixtures put in our house, but they weren't clean. Not to mama bear standards, anyway. So... Being the independent woman that she is, and she is fully independent, believe me. Rather than asking for help, she says, get me a ladder. I'll put the ladder on the island, and I will climb up to the light fixtures, and I will clean them myself. I'm not climbing on the ladder on the island, right? My brain is how I make a living. If I fall and smash this pretty little face, we got a problem. Call somebody to do that. Can I get an amen? I mean, she wanted to reach something that no one else had reached. But to do it, she had to do something no one else was willing to do. Wherever you are in your life, the same is true. You want to reach a new place in your marriage, you're going to have to do what you haven't yet done in your marriage to get there. You want to reach a new place at your workplace, you're going to have to do what no one else is doing. Maybe you need to be the good attitude in the room when everyone else is sour. Maybe you need to be early and stay a little late. Maybe you need to be the one that volunteers to take on a little bit extra so that you can carry a little bit of load that no one else is carrying. If you want to reach places and things that no one else is reaching, you're going to have to do what no one else is doing. That's what the early church did. This is super cool about the early church, and I've talked about this before, but I think it's so powerful. The early church was so committed and devoted that whenever they came to kill them, here's what happened. They spread, and they reached more people. Why? Because they went places no one else was going to. 
They did things no one else was doing. If we want to have it in our lives, we're going to have to be laser focused. We're going to have to do things that no one else is doing. I was at lunch this week, and, and this really nice lady, she, she uh, came up to the table, and it was one of those awkward moments when you're trying to like figure out who this is, right? Like the wheels are turning, but I can't tell because I can't see anybody. And so super confusing. And, and then she asked about having a concert at the church because one time years ago, we made the mistake of hosting a Christian concert here. You're like, but why don't we do that anymore? Let me tell you why. Because we worked all of our volunteers to death, and we had a mountain of stuff to clean up for a bunch of Christians from other churches to come in and use our building to enjoy a free concert, steal our soap, and leave. That's what happened. It took all the bath and body works. That stuff ain't free. We looked at each other, Jared and I did, after like this 18-hour day, and we're like, we ain't ever doing that again. Why? Because we weren't reaching anyone that wasn't already being reached. We got to do things no one else is doing. We have to go places no one else is going, right? I don't want to go fish where everyone else is fishing. I want to do something no one else is doing and go to a place no one else is going to. Why? Because it is then that we have it and an opportunity to make a real difference in the world. And you got to hear this and understand it because many of you, the insecurities start to flow in your head when I say things like, you're like, oh, I can't do that. Or you're thinking of the thing that you know you should be focused on that you're not focused on and all the reasons why you just don't measure up. You have everything that you need to do everything that God wants you to do. All of it. And it doesn't feel like it because we see obstacles. But number two, I want you to write this down. If you want to have it in your life, you're going to have to see opportunities where others see obstacles. You've got to see the opportunity. If, you see, if you don't yet have what you need, God wants you to see what you haven't yet seen. In Acts chapter 3, early church still, right? Like just getting started, just getting going, J just rolling around. It says one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. See that rhythm? See that pace? At three in the afternoon, they're there. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. I don't have it. Now, most of us in there, right, because we see the obstacle. I don't have what you need. You say you need money. I don't have money. This conversation is over. I, I see the obstacle that is between us, which is I don't have what you say that you need. There's a disconnect here, and we don't have it. But, but Peter, instead of seeing the obstacle, sees the opportunity. He says, I, what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. See, Peter's laser focused on it. He understands Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is it. So here's what he understood. What seemed like an obstacle, I don't have any money, and you need money, is really just an opportunity for me to give you what you really need, which is Jesus. And the power and authority and miraculous wonder working power that he has inside of him. Let me give you something that you actually need rather than what it is that you say you need. He didn't walk away just like, oh man, get out of here. I don't have any money and I don't know what to tell you and this isn't going to work. No, Peter says it may seem like an obstacle, but it's really an opportunity. But for so many of us, here, here, here's why we don't see opportunity. And here's why we only see obstacles. Because we're unwilling to fail. So number three is this. You have to be willing to fail if you're going to have it in your life. So many of us are like, man, failure's not an option. Anybody, anybody feel that way? Like, you just feel like failure's not an option, right? Like, oh, no, none of y'all are afraid to fail. Six of us, fantastic. <laughs> I'm terrified of failing, right? I don't even get joyful when I win because I'm just so afraid of losing, right? There's not even joy in winning. It's like, well, I didn't lose. Thank God, you know. 
But the truth is this. We say failure isn't optional. I would tell you failure is mandatory. It's a mandatory part of your life, your growth, your understanding. Why? Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you in advance. I'm the way, the truth, the life. Meaning what? We cannot do it ourselves. We don't have it. He does. We don't have to have the pressure of waking up every day and saying, oh, man, I just I don't want to mess this up and I don't want to screw this up and I don't want to fail. No, we should wake up every day saying, I'm going to take risks that are so great and so big that whenever I do finally land where I need to land, it's going to be so obvious that it was God that the whole world's going to see his glory shine through me. I should be stepping out and saying, you know what, man, that person, like, ah, oh, man, I really feel like they need to come, but I don't like to invite people to church because nobody does. I don't like to invite people to church. I'm a pastor. I planted a church with no one. I had to invite everybody. It's not fun. Let's call it what it is. But it, it's something we're called to do. So we step out. Why do we not like inviting people to church? Because we're afraid they'll say no. Or they might come and the pastor yells at them and stuff, and then they... That's why do you go to that church? We have all of this fear of failure, and it prevents us from being the it that we're called to be. It prevents us from pointing people to who Jesus truly is. I've told this story before, but it illustrates the point so well. When, when we decided that we were going to launch a church, we scheduled four launch team meetings. And the first one actually went pretty well. Like, it, it was good, right? Right? We shared all this vision, and the people were engaged, and they were excited. We had a really good turnout. I'm like, oh, man, this is, man, ain't got nothing on me, you know. We got this. We be all right. And then the second one, like four people came. <laughs> Great, we went from 35 to 4 real quick, killing it over here, right? And I didn't want to have any more. That was my solution, right? My solution was, okay, we're still going to plant the church, but we're not going to have launch meetings anymore. Because I failed, right? Yes, that was a failure. Y- y- y'all can all like be like, I don't know, was it? Yes, it was a failure. Four people came. It was a failure. It was miserable, all right? There was no energy in the room. Like, the, like it, just, it just it didn't hit. It just was one of those days, right? It wasn't connecting. It, 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 was, it was tough. It was miserable. So I thought, we'll just cancel three and four like, we just won't really acknowledge it. We'll just kind of move on like it never really happened, and we never really said that we were going to have four, and that's not really what we were going to do. And one night I'm laying in bed, and my wife looks at me because she's the one that climbs on the ladder and goes places no one else will go to reach things no one else will, will reach, and she's like, you have to have all four. I said, why? She says, because nobody follows a leader that goes back on his word. She said, if, if it's just you and me, it's just you and me. We're going to have them. And I cried. If I'm being honest, because I didn't want to, and it was miserable, and I was scared, and some people came at three, and some people came at four, and then we launched a church, and here we are. Look at us now. (laughs) Failure was mandatory. I learned about how to lead a meeting better and how to cast better vision. And let me tell you something. I did a lot of work between meetings two and three. I called every pastor I knew and said, what should I do differently? Here's what I did at the last one. And I took all the criticism and all of the feedback. I took online leadership course. Like literally, if I could get my hands on I read every John Maxwell book you could find, right? I was doing everything I could between because I didn't want to fail again, but I had to take the risk. If we wouldn't have had launch meetings three and four, I can promise you we wouldn't be here today where we are seeing God move. And and here's what you have to accept. I shared this with with, with our staff. I, I said, a failed plan is not a failed vision. Sometimes we poorly execute a very God given vision. So don't write off the vision God gave you just because it didn't come out the way you wanted it to. Sometimes you have to fail to learn the right way to do it. You learn a lot in failure. A lot of how not to's, right? 
Don't do it that way, and don't do it that way, and don't do it that way. And eventually, you've eliminated all the wrong ways to do it. You fail enough, you find success. You find the right way if you're doing the work in the middle and in the in between. You've got to see the opportunity instead of the obstacle. You've got to be laser focused and you have to be willing to fail. Very last thing, you've got to get around people that have it. If you want it, you got to get around people that have it. You know, one of the most powerful things about a gathering that, that we don't often talk about, like, like a weekly gathering, is that a huge part of what we're doing is letting it rub off on other people. You see, there's a lot of brand new Christians and new believers that, that maybe don't understand like what it is that they do or, or, or what it is that they should do. So guess what we do when we come together? We model that. How? We pray together, because you should pray. We read God's word together, because you should read God's word. We worship God together, because you should worship together. We fellowship and break bread together. Why? Because you should fellowship and break bread together. What we're doing is giving people an opportunity to experience it when they don't know what it is. If you want to be better in your life, you're going to have to get around some people that have it. But instead, we have a natural tendency to get around people that don't have it in hopes that we're the one that has it. Like, I'm not going to surround myself with anybody better than me, right? I'll just surround myself with people that are lesser than me, and then I'll feel better about me. One degree off. Just one degree off. But there's no one in my life challenging me. But I'm trying to move north, but I'm one degree off. And all of a sudden, I look up and that decade's gone. That marriage is gone. That business is gone. Why? Because I didn't surround myself with people that had it. And listen, you got to get around people that have it, and then you got to shake off the haters. All right? Everybody everybody do a little shake. Come on now. We're going to loosen up in church a little bit. Man, y'all can't dance at all. It's bad. I heard a story. There was a village. The village only had one mule. So this mule was highly important to this village. But there was a big hole in the middle of the village, and this mule fell in the hole. So all of the villagers spend all day trying to figure out how to get this mule out of the hole. And they can't figure it out, right? They don't have any heavy equipment. They don't have any masterful skill set. The mule is stuck in the hole, and they don't know what to do. A couple of days pass. The mule's starting to get sick. The mule's starting to get tired. So one of the village elders says, I guess we need to bury the mule. He's going to die. Everyone's like, okay, I guess that's what we'll do. We'll bury the mule. So they take a shovel, and they throw the dirt in on the mule's back. And the mule shakes the dirt off. They take a shovel, they throw it, the dirt in on the mule's back, and the mule shakes the dirt off. Ten, fifty, a hundred shovels full. The mule keeps shaking the dirt off, and as he's shaking it off, he's stepping on top of the dirt that they're throwing in the hole. Two hundred shovels full of mules shaking it off. And all of a sudden, what the mule finds is that he's walking up out of the hole. They're throwing dirt at him, trying to bury him, trying to tell him that he doesn't have it anymore, that he's not of value. But what the mule does is he just keeps shaking it off long enough to climb himself up out of the hole. Some of you need to start shaking off all of the dirt and get around some people that have it. Why? So that you'll be willing to fail. So that you'll see the obstacle as an opportunity. So that you'll become laser focused in your life. And then all of a sudden, it all begins to align. You're moving true north and you're like, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes through the Father except through Jesus. And it's my purpose and my mission to share that good news with the world, and I'm going to be focused on it, and I'm going to see opportunity, and I'm going to be willing to fail, and I'm going to surround myself with other people that are in unison and in unity with what it is that God's called me to do, and then I've got it, because I've got all 
the Jesus in me and around me that I need. Jesus is it. Heavenly Father, God, we praise you. We love you. We thank you for your word, your truth, your goodness. We thank you that you care about us enough. That you went before us to make a place for us. And God, when we feel distracted and we feel chaotic and we feel like there's no direction in our lives, I pray that we would just come back to this simple passage where you remind us that you, we don't have to know every step or every turn or every twist. All we have to do is know that you are the way, that you are the truth, that you are the life, and that we will come to the Father in and through you and your blood shed for us. God, I pray that we would let that truth empower us. As Michael said, that, that we would just say, like, God loves me. Like, the creator of the heavens and the earth loves me. The one that called light into existence loves me. The one that made the heavens and the earth loves me. The one that made the oceans and the mountains and the valleys and the animals loves me. That I'm chosen and that I have a purpose. And God, I pray that we would become focused. That we would see the opportunity that's all around us. That we would be willing to fail. And God, that we would surround ourselves with people that have it. Heads bowed, eyes closed all across this place. If there's anybody in this room that would just simply say, like, hey, Jacob, like, man, I'm just struggling. Like, I'm not focused and, 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 and I'm not moving in the pace of grace. I'm kind of all over the place. And I'm not willing to fail. I'm not taking any risk. I'm not stepping out of my comfort zone. I'm not, I'm not doing these things. I'm missing it in my life. Would you just slip your hand up? Nobody's looking around. I just want to pray with you right where you are. Thanks, guys. I mean, Heavenly Father, God, I pray right now that you would just begin to empower those bold enough to raise their hand. Like, what, what, what a step, God. What a step of faith to say, like, I, you know, I, I need more it. I need more of you. I need more boldness. I need more risk-taking. I need more clarity of vision. I need more focus in my life. I need more willingness to fail. God, I need to see opportunities instead of obstacles. And God, I need to surround myself with people that have it, that are more like you. God, I pray that you would empower that boldness and that you would allow it to, to move beyond a hand raised in a local gathering and that you would send it into their Mondays and Tuesdays, that they would begin to see their week differently, that they would begin to see their relationships differently, and that they would move forward and be all that you have called them to be because you called them to be world changers. You called them to be kingdom builders. You called them to be people that are followed by signs and wonders and miracles because they are walking with you in goodness and heads bowed eyes closed all across this place feel if there's anybody in this room maybe you're watching online you can send us a message but you would simply say like i mean i don't this like you only come to the father through jesus like i don't know jesus it's like i don't know what that means for me i, I don't have a personal relationship with jesus I, I don't i don't really understand all of this but i know that i want to get right with him and i want a place in this heaven that you talk about if you're just in the room and you say, like, I, I just, I, I need that in my life. I need Jesus to be the Savior of my life. Would you just slip your hand up? Nobody's looking around. Nobody's judging or watching online. Send us a message. We appreciate it. Everybody say this with me out loud and proud because we all need a Savior. Dear Jesus, I thank you for dying for my sins. I ask that you cleanse me and that you make me new. I acknowledge that you are my Savior. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, everybody, stand up all across this place. Everybody say, I will be it in the world around me. In Jesus' name. I love you guys. Have a great week.